Every day, solvable problems go unsolved. Because governments aren't transparent, accessible, accountable. Some problems go unsolved because governments don't know how to help or because they just don't want to. Every day, citizens' needs are ignored, overlooked, unheard. When this happens, the link between citizens and their governments grows weaker. Representation is fractured. Progress is stunted. But there is a movement. It's growing. It's about opening government. It's about responding to citizens. It is about using technology and innovation to find new ways for governments to respond to your needs efficiently, effectively, fairly. It's happening all around us. It's changing how people and governments engage. Because some people still think they have no voice or that no one will listen. It's about creating partnerships to bring down barriers that still exist. Because today, in the 21st century, there are opportunities for governments and citizens to engage like never before. This is our grand challenge. To ensure that all voices are heard. To ensure that governments listen and respond effectively, fairly. To find new ways that technology can improve government performance. To build trust and accountability in democracies worldwide. This is our grand challenge, to make all voices count. Join us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Master of Ceremonies, Andrew Roche, founder of Personal Democracy Media. Good morning, everybody. I have to say, looking around the room and seeing so many faces and so many experienced people, I feel a little bit like Einstein's chauffeur. If you don't know the story about Einstein's chauffeur, he was, he was uh, chauffeuring Einstein around while he was um, making his uh, first presentations about the theory of relativity. And he was making the speech three or four times a day, and after about three months, he got pretty tired of it and sat back in his limousine and told his chauffeur that he really felt like you know, he didn't want to do it anymore. And the chauffeur said, well, you know, I've been listening to your speech for three months. I can do it myself. So how about the next place we change places? <laughs> and so uh, at, the next, uh, at the next university lecture hall, that's exactly what happened. Einstein put on the chauffeur's hat, sat in the back of the room, and the chauffeur got on stage and delivered the speech exactly in the same way and cadence as Einstein without missing a beat. But of course, there was a very learned professor in the audience who raised his hand and asked a very complicated question. And without missing a beat, the chauffeur said, you know, that question is so simple, I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> so I feel a little bit like Einstein's chauffeur. It's really great to have you here. Um, thank you for coming all this way to hear about this amazing and very important program. Um, I'm going to act as the MC today, but try to move things as quickly along as possible. But just a few quick opening remarks. The world is getting more connected. It's estimated by the year 2020 that six billion people will have smartphones. And the smartphones that they're going to be carrying are going to make the iPhones and the Android phones that we carry with ourselves today look like the Motorola briefcase phone we carried 15 years ago and didn't really know how to make work. And this, this new connected humanity is, is, is emerging. And whether you look at the way technology affected the Arab Spring or whether you look at the way women use social media to save money for um, health care and contraception, or whether the way the Coney 2012 video ricocheted around the world. It's pretty clear that there is a new, what we call a personal democracy forum, a new internet public emerging. And to be a member of the internet public means that for you, the internet and mobile technologies are central to your lives, to your life, either professionally, economically, culturally, or even spiritually. And members of the internet public you know, think in terms of networks. Um, they don't talk about crowdsourcing, they do it. They use social media easily, and they are, aware, they are very aware that they can connect to each other globally, instantly, and they can reach the eyes and ears of their brethren around the world, and they can make sure that their voices are heard. They also can make sure that the governments are hearing them as well. But governments that fail to recognize this dynamic 
and, th and those, those, those in government who are not listening and responding and participating in this ongoing technologically ena enabled global conversation will find that they are more and more marginalized and unable to authorita authoritatively lead and represent their citizens. Those that do will discover new opportunities to empower their democracies, improve their effectiveness, enhance their economic futures, and develop partnerships with other countries that have already discovered the benefits of more openness and more transparency, which will facilitate more trust between governments and their citizens, and vice versa. This is the reason why this particular initiative, Making All Voices Count, is so important. It seeks to amplify the voices of citizens to bring about change, enable governments in new and emerging democracies to be more open and transparent, and accountable and help governments listen and respond to citizens while improving government performance. So we'll get started. A few small housekeeping notes. Please turn your cell phones to silent so we can be reminded that it's not all about the technology. Uh, we are tweeting um, and the audience can use uh, at all voices count or the hashtag all voices count. Uh, tweets will be displayed on the Twitter wall we have a uh, good Wi-Fi here, but if, you know, we have a lot of people, so everybody at the same time may slow us down, so please switch to 3G if you can. And please don't download the latest um, version of Homeland or some other movie while you're watching the, w watching the proceedings. Uh, we have a packed agenda. I'll play sort of a moderator role, kind of keep things moving. Um, we'll, we're going to be very crisp and to the point, and we're trying to give you as much time to be able to meet each other after the ceremonies are over. Um, but now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please let me uh, introduce to the stage Dr. Rajiv Shah, who's the administrator for the U.S. Agency of International Development, USAID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for taking on this responsibility today and for your leadership. And it is so exciting to welcome everyone here to our fourth Grand Challenge in Global Development launch. So. Thank you so much for being here and for all the energy and enthusiasm that you're bringing to the task we have today, which is to make every voice count in the battle to end corruption and achieve transparency and effective governance around the world. Uh, we're excited that our keynote speaker, Secretary Madeleine Albright, will be here uh, later. And thank you, Ken uh, Wallach, the head of NDI, for also being with us. We are uh, very grateful. Samantha Powers, we appreciate your being here and your leadership in uh, guiding and shaping this grand challenge, but also in just fighting for these issues in, in a tough and ongoing set of environments. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome Sir Peter Westmacott, the British Ambassador to the United States, and Ambassador Jonas Hofstrom from Sweden. We are thrilled that this is not an American initiative. This is a global partnership with the UK, Sweden, and the Omidyard Network. Uh, in that respect, some folks who've done a lot of uh, heavy lifting to make this work, Sarah Mendelson from USAID, Mark Robinson from DFID, Stephen King from the Omidyar Network, thank you for, for being here, and Charlotte Petri Gornitska, the Director General of the Swedish International Development Agency, CETA. We are glad that you're here with us. Earlier this week, earlier this week, there was an article in the New York Times about a wave of violence surrounding a hotly contested election for ward counselor in a small, impoverished town in South Africa. Now, the town isn't alone. In fact, since 2010, violence in local elections in South Africa has led to the death of over 40 politicians. The thing is, ward counselor isn't such a popular job in and of itself. Uh, it pays little, it has uh, thankless and uh, difficult responsibilities. Uh, but what it does have, and what makes it so valuable that people would kill for the opportunity to serve, uh, is in fact a steady stream of kickbacks, bribes, and off-the-book deals. And for this town in South Africa, violence and corruption hasn't just cost lives. It has diminished the faith citizens have that their government is actually trying to fight for and serve themselves and their children's futures. We know that every year, corruption is estimated to cost the world more than $1 trillion, undermining everything from infrastructure to education, health to economic growth. In fact, the World Bank estimates that there is a 400% uh, governance dividend 
in terms of growth rates that is possible when countries achieve transparency and effectively beat out corruption from how they work and their book of business. These are extraordinarily important results. And if you think about the scale of that relative to all foreign assistance that we invest proudly in development, it far exceeds what we as donors proudly invest to serve those who are most vulnerable and help lift them up to a better future. And that's why today's launch is so important, to build on President Obama's call for open government and to inspire a global movement to end corruption and strengthen accountability, which starts with each individual citizen, hopefully ever more enabled by technology and innovation. This grand challenge calls on the world's brightest innovators, entrepreneurs, and engineers to design breakthrough technologies and approaches to make all voices count. And we're seeing examples everywhere. In Indonesia, we work with local organizations to create mini atlases that map community assets like clinics and schools. Here in this slide, brown dots represent clinics and are overlaid on a map of poverty levels by household. The organizations that do this work post these mini atlases in neighborhood public spaces, helping to inform the community and encourage them to be responsive and demanding of better services in these settings. In Bangalore, India, students from Colgate University have helped design exit surveys for citizens as they leave government offices. The team then, then maps survey results onto a similar map which tracks corruption and efficiency in the provision of government services for everyone in that community to see and observe. These exercises are doing more than just mapping where the problem is. The beauty of this work is by bringing visibility to the challenge, people immediately expect more and people that partake in these activities are usually ashamed of the publicity that they receive from these types of efforts. In a world where three quarters of the global population has access to mobile phones and mobile connectivity, we can expect that more texting to see if teachers are showing up in schools and more GIS-based mapping to identify where corruption is robbing people of critically needed services is taking place and we can expect results to therefore improve. In fact, there's no better example of the power of mobile technology to fight corruption than the use of electronic payments and mobile money in settings where the alternative is highly vulnerable to corrupt practices. In 2011, when Kabul Bank in Afghanistan essentially collapsed after insiders were involved in stealing serious uh, assets, we took a similar approach. In addition to demanding more accountability and oversight, we said, why are donors relying on this system to pay civil service employees, police officers, members of the military? Why would we rely on a system that where people actually walk bags of cash to a household and then we are surprised when those bags seem to get lighter along the path? By helping to create the Better Than Cash Alliance with more than a dozen partners, including the Omidyar Network, Visa, governments of countries all around the world, we're now accelerating the adoption of electronic systems that can ensure end-to-end -end payment and serve as a closed loop that fights corruption at its source. When we piloted this effort in Afghanistan with employees and police officers, those receiving payments thought they were getting a 30% raise. These types of examples show the power of technology to transform development outcomes. And we're particularly excited with that this is an example of the President's Grand Challenges in Development program. Our first Grand Challenge, Saving Lives at Birth, has already resulted in exciting new innovations, some of which have come from student groups from Tulane University to Makerere University that are in the field saving infants' lives in the first 48 hours of life. Last November, we launched a grand challenge in education to ensure we use technology and innovation to give every child the opportunity to read and improve literacy outcomes at grade level. We've already awarded more than 32 
awards through this program, many to local organizations that have come up with the most innovative ideas. This past June, we launched the third grand challenge, which was powering agriculture, helping small-scale agricultural producers get off-grid energy on their farms for the purpose of improving incomes and outputs. In total, these programs have attracted more than 1,600 innovative ideas. 30% of the proposals we get come from sources that have never worked with the U.S. government before on these types of issues, and 50% come from the developing world itself, proving that the best ideas, the most important innovations, often will come directly from the communities that stand to benefit from implement, implementing them at scale. The truth is these, these ideas can come from anywhere, and it's our goal to adopt them, help them scale, and help them transform people's lives in the most vulnerable settings around the world. So as today's launch demonstrates, we want to continue to be a platform for open source development, for open innovation and new ideas. We believe that technology applied thoughtfully and in a manner that's respectful of local norms and customs and cultures can empower people to demand democratic change and processes as we've seen through the Arab Spring, to demand greater accountability and services as we're seeing in Bangladesh and India and Kenya and Haiti, and to demand that when you're paying a civil service employee, they're actually receiving their paycheck. So thank you for being here to celebrate this, but most importantly, thank you for the work you will do leaving today to encourage others to look up the Grand Challenge, to propose new innovative ideas, no matter how small and no matter where they come from, we know innovation can come from anywhere and can help make our world more peaceful and more prosperous in the future. Thank you. When your voices are heard in government, it's far more likely that your basic needs will be met. And that's why reform must reach the daily lives of those who are hungry and those who are ill and those who live without electricity or water. Today I say to you and I say to everybody that can hear my voice that the United States of America is with you, including those who have been forgotten, those who are dispossessed, those who are ostracized, those who are poor. We carry your story in our heads and your hopes in our hearts. Because in this 21st century, with the spread of technology and the breaking down of barriers, the front lines of freedom are within nations and individuals, not simply between them. As one former prisoner put it in speaking to his fellow citizens, politics is your job. It's not only for politicians. But we have an expression in the United States that the most important office in a democracy is the office of citizen. Not president, not speaker, but citizen. Please welcome to the stage Samantha Power, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights. Never a good idea to follow Barack Obama. <laughs> Raj, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's a huge honor. Um, and I want to thank uh, everybody that Raj thanked. Um, and uh, maybe let me say a special word about Sarah Mendelson, who is uh, the USAID uh, bulldog, um, who uh, seizes upon uh, ideas, meets with citizens around the world, feels uh, their needs, and uh, just works 24-7 uh, to operationalize them. I hope you don't mind, Raj, that I'm uh, calling her out in this way, but having uh, just emailed with her at, I think, uh, 10 p.m., 1 a.m., 3 a.m., uh, around a series of issues uh, this night, I'm just reminded um, that, you know, efforts like this uh, require people like Sarah. Uh, thanks also to our great colleagues from Sweden and from the UK, 
Um, uh, again, Raj has, has named everybody, um, but uh, the Omidyar Network, um, this is just an emblem, I think, this effort of how we need to work together, private sector, foundations, governments uh, from around the world, um, pooling resources, but more importantly, even pooling ideas um, and the innovative spirit that I think underlines this great, the great effort. Um, so I was, I <laughs> we don't like that, but what was there before, uh, I was with President Obama in, uh, in Burma and when he gave that speech. And the one thing you should know, uh, there are many things you should know, but what you saw, a very large part of what you saw just there was ad-libbed um, because he was so taken by the moment. And that applause line, uh, which is a line from Louis Brandeis, um, was something that he came up, uh, up with on the spot. Again, just so taken by the students who were gathering um, in that university for the first time in a very long time. As many of you know, uh, the university was closed uh, in the wake of uh, protests back in, in 1990. And uh, so for students to gather in that way and even hear the president would itself just a, a month ago or maybe even a week before, certainly a couple years ago, have been um, uh, illegal. Um, and so uh, it was an incredibly uh, moving trip. Uh, in the audience also, um, it should be noted, were uh, form recently released political prisoners religious leaders and, you know, current uh, activists, political prisoners, of course, themselves are current activists. Uh, one And the president met with a group of those people just in advance of the speech. Uh, one of them was a, a woman who had helped organize uh, a peaceful protest on September 21st and who'd been arrested, just underscoring again how, how great the challenges remain uh, in the political reform journey. Um, and by coincidence, her court date uh, was coincided with the time of the president's speech. So when she got the invitation to the speech, she was able to use it uh, as an excuse with the judge to get out of her uh, appearance. Um, so uh, these sort of strands kind of came together. But I, 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 uh, I think what you, what you hear in the president's words um, is uh, the recognition uh, coming from his own experience, of course, uh, back in Chicago and also, of course, uh, through the campaign back in, in 2007, 2008, and most recently. Um, of the critical role of the bottom-up uh, players um, in, in making change. Uh, there is no change uh, without a citizenry, as he, as he said, uh, again, very eloquently. I also had the privilege of, of being with the president, um, as I think was Raj, uh, in September 2010 uh, at the UN General Assembly when he told the world uh, that the strongest foundation for human progress lies in open economies open government and open society. So this was September 2010 in his UN General Assembly speech. And what he did in that speech was he challenged uh, the countries, the heads of state who gathered, of course, in the annual uh, General Assembly um, leaders meeting uh, to come back one year hence with a set of specific commitments to promote transparency, to fight corruption, and to energize civ civic engagement, leveraging new technologies um, so that we all sort of strengthen the foundation of freedom in our own countries. And, and again, this is in keeping with President Obama's um, firm conviction that we have to start by leading by example, and that that's the best foundation for our leadership abroad. Uh, a year later, the following UN General Assembly in September 2011, um, really remarkably, uh, nearly 40 countries uh, came together and answered that challenge. Um, President Rousseff of Brazil and President Obama co-launched what is now known as the Open Government Partnership, or OGP, and uh, we will be showing a video on OGP in, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, six other countries were part of the, the founding steering body, which included Mexico, uh, Indonesia, and South Africa. Very important to see emerging democracies uh, stepping out and, and leading uh, on these critical issues beyond their borders. Um, as well, of course, as the UK, um, which is currently the current co-chair of OGP with Indonesia. Um, uh, our leadership has passed from the United States and Brazil to the UK and, and uh, Indonesia. Um, and we're in a very critical phase of, of OGP's uh, development. Um, now, as I mentioned, the president's vision on these issues is really shaped by his experience uh, on the streets of Chicago, working with communities to try to make local, state, and, and federal government more responsive to the real needs of real people. Um, and since 2009, one of the first things that the president did domestically was issue an open government memorandum 
making what had previously been um, closed uh, government data sets open and available uh, to the outside world, um, promoting greater disclosure uh, and greater progress on freedom of information, and just making sure that you know, citizens had access to health and safety uh, and environmental information that could change the decisions that they make day to day. Uh, and finally, soliciting ideas from citizens day to day. Um, uh, we have a We the People petition uh, site now up on the White House and, and the open source software for that is, has been made available to countries all around the world as has the data.gov uh, platform. Um, uh, so the question is, is, as the President said back in his first inaugural address, you know, the question is not whether government is too big or too small, it's whether it works. <laughs> and uh, it's a question we struggle, those of us who work in government, to, to answer in the affirmative uh, every day. Today, the OGP has grown to include 57 countries, um, with many more countries, such as Tunisia and most recently Burma, in association with the trip, making reforms in the aspiration that they will become eligible. Uh, countries are eligible to join if they meet rigorous objective standards measuring freedom of information, access to information, disclosure laws, um, transparency of budgets, uh, civil liberties, uh, and accountability, again, to citizenry. Each OGP government of the 57 has endorsed an open government declaration, which lays out a vision of good governance grounded uh, in openness. And each government has also committed to develop and implement their, their own authored national action plan. Uh, and that plan, the one requirement that's pretty rigid and that we need to hold ourselves and, and other governments accountable to is that that plan be developed uh, with civil society at the table. And we have struggled to make that real in some countries uh, or struggle to make, even if civil society is at one table at one time, uh, for it to be a genuinely consultative process is, is a work in progress uh, with some of the, our country partners. Um, but that said, uh, collectively the 57 countries who are part of OGP in their national action plans have made over 300 commitments that could uh, begin to impact uh, over 2 billion people. I mean, that is the, the number of people covered by the countries involved. And just a few examples of where we've already seen very concrete steps taken, Brazil, <laughs> now has a powerful freedom of information law that, that um, finally had been stalled for many, many years and that got through uh, uh, the parliament uh, thanks to President uh, Rousseff's leadership, but definitely nudged on by the, the framework that was OGP. The Philippines and Indonesia's uh, have shared, Philippines and Indonesia have shared their experiences on check my school so citizens can know whether money is reaching schools or whether children are actually learning. Um, the plans contain strong commitments to implement reforms focused on enhanced transparency, the fight against corruption, and the strengthening of communication between governments and citizens. If you look at them, they're all on the Open Government website. Um, there's some really impressive uh, commitments and pledges that have been laid down, but we have to ensure that they are not just plans, uh, that they are put in motion in a hurry. Um, over the past year, OGP has, has established clear processes um, through which governments and civil society can work together as partners. OGP now has a technical support unit and is just bringing on new people uh, that will be based here in the United States but should uh, be operating and partnering with countries all around the world. USAID supports that uh, and works, and this unit works with local um, and international civil society to help governments fulfill uh, these commitments, and USAID and DFID and we hope our other development partners are doing the same out in the field. Um, and that's a critical piece of the interface because we have obviously offices and experts in places that uh, uh, a small support unit uh, never will. Um, so things are moving, uh, but I think it's important, if I could, just before I, I, uh, I close out, um, to, to issue a little bit of a, a warning on all of this. Um, and here I would quote uh, the great Rakesh Rajani, uh, his uh, words at a recent OGP gathering where he never lets us get too uh, fat or happy, uh, <laughs> um, and, and you'll hear why. Uh, Rakesh said, quote, changing long established cultures and practices anywhere is hard. Changing the culture of government is even harder. Long ago, my father gave me some stern advice. Son, he told me, you need to avoid three things in life, fire, stormy seas, and the government. <laughs> Many people across the world would agree with that advice because their primary experience of government is not a positive one. 
And uh, in Kenya, for instance, we, we, we have, again, these great commitments. The Open Data Portal makes an impressive level of data public for the first time, but few are using it. These are Rakesh's examples. In, in Tanzania, the project to enable citizens to report broken water points through their mobile phones, a project that, was featured, that will be featured in the OGP launch film you're about to see, um, has largely failed because people simply didn't believe that reporting data would make a difference. How do you activate the citizens and, and give them that faith? The true metric of this partnership and ultimately the, the, the measure of making voices count is not how many countries sign on uh, to the open government, the ideals of open government, uh, but how many ex citizens experience concrete improvements in their lives. And that's why the new independent review mechanism, which Gracia Michelle, Mo Ibrahim, and Mary Robinson are now comprising, um, uh, will be so important and, and critical to the success of OGP. Um, one of the key premises of making all voices count, this remarkable new initiative, is that feedback from citizens on government performance is the most direct way to encourage greater governmental reform. And the promise of this new initiative is that it will bolster citizens' ability to provide input to government decision makers, as well as to tackle the very hard issue of helping governments listen and respond to that feedback, thus improving trust in government so it doesn't, isn't listed with the stormy seas and fire <laughs> uh, in, for generations hence. We have high hopes for making all voices count, and we look forward to working with this team of uh, remarkable partners. Thank you. So we're going to watch a video now, which is uh, about the Open Government Partnership, which I'd like you to think of as really the foundation for this entire movement and for, for in fact, for this program today. Please welcome to the stage the British Ambassador to the United States, Sir Peter Westmacott.
Well, thank you very much for the welcome. Um, it's a great treat to be here with so many distinguished developmental experts. Just a few days ago, I was with Raj, where he was leading a different sort of partnership, a different sort of alliances, which was between government CEOs uh, and uh, NGOs in order to try to do more about deforestation. So here we are a few days later doing something about open government. And um, I'm very pleased to be a part of that process. Um, you know, who would have thought that back in the days when a tweet was something that birds did and a cloud was something that was up in the sky, <laughs> an app was something you sent to a university admissions office hoping you might get an education, <laughs> and, and Google was a misprint for the word that means 10 to the power of 100, which of course it was, and that's by mistake really that Google came to be part of our vocabulary. But in those days, mobile phones would very soon become a, a means of improving the daily lives of people in the poorest countries in the world, the Arab Spring would be something which was generated by social media, by new ways of communicating, of citizens making a difference to the daily lives and holding governments up accountable. That farmers today can find that they can check crop prices on their mobile telephones in India. And that Pakistani citizens can hold their governments to account for corruption by reporting uh, misdeeds by mobile telephones. And that in Uganda, patients can report medical supply shortages by text message. All this extraordinary transformation of technology of the lives of ordinary people in many of the world's poorest countries is the background against which we, my government, British government, uh, and our partners uh, come together as part of this exercise. And we are delighted to be part of making all voices count because there are so many more ways now in which voices can count with our friends from the United States, from Sweden, from the Omidyar network. And it's against the background, really, of two or three big policy initiatives uh, that we are taking part in this. First of all, as Samantha was just saying a moment ago, uh, British government is uh, front and center as part of the Open Government Partnership. There were just eight governments, including Britain and America and a bunch of others, a year ago, I think, when the Open Government Partnership was founded. 47 more have joined us since then. And it has made, I think, an extraordinary difference to the whole business of open government, less corruption, more information, citizen participation, and improving the quality of governance around the world. And that's a, a big priority uh, for my government as it is for the United States government. And it links separately to the role which we now have as co-chair of the high-level group which is designed to take forward the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which are going to expire in a couple of years' time. David Cameron is there with the, Niger with the Indonesian uh, government uh, looking for ways of taking that forward. And it is part of open government, but it is also an exercise, in his view, of trying to ensure that international development policy from here on in not only looks at providing relief where there is poverty and there is need, but also about focusing on the fundamental reasons for poverty, getting down to the root causes of what's going wrong in so many countries. So in the context both of open government partnership, of the Millennium Development Goals uh, follow-up, and of our own G8 presidency, which we assume uh, from the United States at the end of the year, the British government is really very proud to be a part of this exercise. And allow me to say also that it's against the background of a government which, despite a pretty tricky economic environment, uh, three consecutive quarters of negative growth until we got a little bit of better news in the last quarter, has stuck steadfastly to the commitment to spending 0.7% of our national income on international development. It's against this background of wanting to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll pass it on to David Cameron. He'll, <laughs> he, he doesn't get much thanks these days. But it's, all, it's partly because we're convinced it's the right thing to do, but it's also because we think that it is by assisting governments, countries which need that support, that we have got our own self-interest uh, at, at mind, in mind, and that we can develop more markets, more prosperity, and find more of that reco economic recovery which we all need. Now, David Cameron recently uh, put out his thoughts on many of these issues in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Allow me just to quote a few words, uh, and then I'll pass on to a real expert uh, to explain the British government's position. And in the, in the journal, what uh, David Cameron wrote was, the way out of poverty is to help people stand on their own two feet, incentivize and reward hard work, and make aspiration the engine of growth. In other words, yes, support where we need it, but let's help people stand on their own two feet. And that is the biggest single objective that we're trying to do alongside poverty eradication with our own commitment to uh, a very strong international development contribution. 
Now, we have a new International Development Secretary in the British government. She hasn't been in the position very long, but Justine Greening is going to come on uh, in a video in just a moment. She's a Member of Parliament since 2005, but she took over as International uh, Se Development Secretary at Department for International Development just a few weeks ago. And she's already made her mark, and I'll summarize perhaps her approach to the job when she remarked just recently in a speech that the challenge to our generation is to use the technologies of the 21st century, mobile apps, all those telephones, the things I was talking about, to transform people's lives. That's what we're going to try and do. That is what, if the technology works, Justine Greening, my International Development Secretary, will now explain to you uh, better than I can why the British government is so proud to be part of making all voices count. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but thanks for this opportunity to say a few words. I'm really pleased that my department is joining with USAID, Omidyar Network and Sweden to set up this particular grand challenge for development, which will help prove science and technology can be used to find solutions to some of the big challenges facing us in development. Right now, I think is a really important moment when we can grasp the opportunities that mobile and internet technology offer to change the ways that citizens and governments interact to generate economic opportunities and to transform service delivery. Since taking charge of my department, I've been clear that technology and innovation will be a constant theme in my work at DFID, and that I expect to see the department making the most of the latest advances in technology and research. Making All Voices Count is a great example of the kind of programmes that I hope DFID will be supporting in the future. Donors, including DFID, have been funding initiatives that use information and communication technology for development for years. Some of those were successful and made a difference. Some failed, despite large financial investments, because they were all about the technology and not about the people using it. Making all voices count will look first for the problem that needs to be solved and then invite new ideas and applications that have the potential to address that problem. It'll start with the people with individuals, with community organisations, with local governments, and support them to find ways to harness mobile and internet technology to solve their problems. We're going to focus on a small number of emerging democracies so that we can maximise opportunities for change. Also, it'll be investing significantly in robust monitoring of every initiative that it funds, whether a small grant for innovation or a larger programme to take early success to scale. So I think this is a really exciting time to be working to find new ways to help people use mobile and web technologies to change their lives and to open up their societies and their governments. I look forward to working with you on this grand challenge for development. So I'd like, I'd like to invite our first panelists up onto the stage if I could and while they're getting themselves here, I'll do a short introduction of them. We're gonna be joined by Charlotte Petri Gornitska, who's the Director General of the Swedish International Development Agency. We're going to also be joined by Susan Glasser, who's the Editor in Chief of Foreign Policy. And we're also going to be joined by my friend uh, and longtime uh, activist in this arena, Ginny Hun, who's the Principal for Strategy and Civic Innovation at Google. And um, they're going to talk a little bit about the current state of the world related to open government and accountability and transparency and, of course, citizen engagement. And I'm going to ask Susan if you could give us your quick view to start us off. Well, thank you so much, uh, and thank you to all of you. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a risky move to go to the journalist first. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, one thing I've learned uh, from listening to the speaker so far and to seeing these videos, right, is that we are definitely filled with a group of people uh, who are on the optimism side of what technology can do to power change in the world. And in many ways, um, you know, I was struck by in, in the video introducing the Open Government Initiative, uh, this almost, not fully straight line, but almost straight line that we had uh, between technology and faith in government rising. And, um, you know, I wanna get, I wanna, I wanna get the thoughts of, of the other panelists this morning on that question and whether there is really that much of a direct connection that you're seeing in your work between uh, these incredible new tools and uh, whether you see a direct link between that. That being said, uh, as a journalist, uh, I'm also struck by the, the fact that in many ways these new tools are empowering uh, not only citizens, but, but government is finally getting the message uh, that uh, investigative reporters have known all along, right, which is that uh, openness and transparency uh, are the tools that can, that can change 
the world, whether they can directly change the world uh, in such a straight line or not, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think if we look today uh, at some of the issues that we write about all the time, whether it is uh, the year after the Arab Spring, uh, where it's, it's, it's not entirely clear, is it, that um, you, know, you might have a viral video uh, that millions of people see around the world that inspires them to think about what they could do uh, to catch Joseph Kony, but in the end, you still have to catch Joseph Kony, and by the way, we still haven't done that. And so I just, I would inter interject a note of caution as somebody who's been out there uh, preaching the virtues of openness and transparency. These are better tools than we've ever had, uh, and everybody needs to change what they do in many ways, and the fact that government is putting data sets online and, and thinking in a radically different way for government, you know, is, that's a big foreign policy story in a way that you certainly wouldn't have said, what, what does technology have to do with foreign policy uh, 10 years ago? That's not the case now. It's a big part of what we write about. But uh, we're not at the end of the story. We're at the beginning of the story. So let's, uh, let's talk about it. Great. Well, I think you asked a good question, which is, is information enough? Is openness enough? And I think one of the things we've seen is information is a starting point. Giving everyone access to information is one part of the building block. And technology enables that. But it's not enough, and what's exciting about this challenge and about the political will and leadership we've seen behind transparency and openness is it really comes down to collaboration and enabling problem solving, um, not just at a national level, but a local level and at scale. So it's exciting about the confluence of what we've seen is that in many ways technology is catching up uh, and enabling what we're seeing with the growth and political will for governments and civil society to work constructively to identify and solve problems down to the community level. So I think to your point, I think it will to be told uh, if the two are going to follow the same trajectory. But what's exciting to see today is that capacity is going to be enabled with the political will that we've already seen around the world. Do you agree? Yeah, well, I, I think we should be on the positive side. I mean, the, the challenge is not a new one, uh, but the way that we are tackling it together and, and representing Sweden in this, I must say I'm very proud to be part of this. Uh, we must realize that the opportunity that technology gives is fantastic. And just one example is we, we will find ways to reach out to people that we have had so many excuses not to reach out to, to indigenous people, to disabled people, who actually communicates better uh, with the new tools. So the new tools will uh, enable change. But I, I think that if we underestimate, and especially governments already up and running, if we underestimate the work that it will mean for governments in managing expectations, changing ways of working, and believe that the new technology is the solution itself, then we are on a risky path. So I think this will actually lead to a lot of more work to be done uh, on top of the new possibilities that the technology as such delivers. Well, and I'm, I'm struck by how much our uh, embrace of new technologies and our creativity collectively that has led us to these new tools. We've, we've outstripped in many ways uh, the existing regime for thinking about internationally how to, how, how to regulate. What are the rules of the road? There's a, a meeting, a controversial uh, meeting this week uh, in uh, the Middle East to talk about uh, internet governance of the future. And uh, free speech now, it, it's Google and other corporations uh, who are leading us to think about, well, what do you do as you operate in all these different countries? And I, I think I'm curious what, as a, as a government person, looking at it from the perspective of Sweden, um, do you have the right setup, the right international governance framework to be able to take these tools into different countries all over the world that don't have the same standards for free speech? Or what about these corruption uh, fighting tools that you're going to put in the hands of people? Well, I think it's, uh, it's early stages in the sense. I mean, and just to give you one example of, of what the Swedish uh, development agency that I run uh, we, what we do now is that we actually have a call for proposal for new ideas on, on uh, ICT for freedom of ex expression. Mm -hmm. And we have had a lot of applications, so there's a great interest out there. But still, the focus is, is NGOs and groups working for freedom of expression. And it's still being, we're still, um, we still need more um, dialogue with governments and really preparation and political will. And, and I think it's, too early to say that this is 
an easy task to tackle or just, you know, wanted by, by many yet. And that's also why I think that we need to distinguish between uh, emerging governments with the possibility to build, uh, a possibility to listen to people, but also thinking about the challenge in, in the, around the Arab Spring, which is different. And we mustn't believe that this is one solution fits all. It's really, really a broad topic that has to be contextualized. Mm -hmm. And where do companies like Google, do you think, uh, come down in this? You have to operate in many different countries, but you come at it from the perspective of a US company. Uh, what's your role in helping to navigate and to create uh, the speech environment for this new global architecture? Right, well, on behalf of our users in particular, I think we would definitely believe that it's hard to make all voices count if those voices can't be heard. Um, as a starting point. And I also just came in from Nairobi around a conversation around devolution and the creation of counties. I think to your point of local governments um, and governments around the world. And the strong point that in the message they brought back was, we know how to organize our communities and we've been working on how to make voices heard and make voices count in many different ways, in many different contexts. I think what's interesting about technology is it enables um, communities to define um, how they can be constructive and collaborative and it enables a platform for that to take place transparently. And when you have, uh, when you run up against opposition, what, what do you think is gonna be the response of this new kind of coalition? This is something very different. Uh, have you talked much about that well, in thinking about the architecture? Well, I, I think that's really the strength of this collaboration, uh, that we are, uh, the ones that we are, uh, that really can, can discuss together, and we, we have a voice together mm -hmm. in tackling this issue, which is a very influential voice. And also the multi-stakeholder, we use this word so often, mm -hmm. but really to, to have uh, the, the private sector as well, and also that this is about new ideas uh, from, uh, from everywhere. And I think together, if we wouldn't tackle the opposition or the, uh, the problems that we face in this collaboration, we wouldn't do what's expected out of a challenge like this. It's a grand challenge, so we have to do that. Uh, but we're very much looking forward to it. We were much better together uh, than separately, and probably this will be an opportunity to feed into the OGP program as well. So looking forward to it very much. I would agree, and to, to reference um, a comment used earlier, the question of the Office of Citizen mm -hmm. is, I think, something that we across all sectors support. And so I think the question becomes, how do we empower that office mm. through this challenge and moving forward? Well, I just one final question, and I, I know we have a busy program today. So all to the well and good, what happens uh, you know, when you run up against societies and uh, with authoritarian governments in which the Office of Citizen is, is not one uh, that has signed up for this full program? Uh, do you have a sense of where this coalition and this group, how far you can pursue this agenda in countries that don't have uh, the same governance model? Well, I don't have, a, you know, the one and only answer to that. I, I think, obviously, that there will be a lot of, of uh, uh, showing by example, there will be a lot of pressure, uh, both opportunities and a lot of pressure, and especially around this OGP in, in connection with this challenge. Uh, and, and I would be disappointed if the governments included in this challenge wouldn't tackle that together. Uh, but how to, uh, I don't have the answer for you today. <laughs> well, we have another question. This one comes from Twitter, which goes right to the heart of what you were, all three of you were just talking about, which is, will citizens use mobile tools for engagement if they don't feel safe to speak out? And the corollary session, the question that actually builds on that is, how do we ensure that citizen reporting can be anonymous, especially with SMS? Well, I think that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what, what the plans of this initiative are, but um, thinking of uh, the country that uh, Sarah Mendelssohn, who brought us all here today, yeah. as Samantha said, uh, that she and I know best, which is, which is Russia. Um, you know, this is a country where uh, these tools are not seen as an effort to improve the workings of mm. government, but as a direct threat yeah. to the established order. Uh, and, you know, uh, the very, very first video said the government has to want to help you, right? And maybe they don't want to. There was just a three-day traffic jam from Moscow to mm. St. Petersburg. Uh, and when desperate motorists trapped in their cars uh, finally reached the government agency responsible, what they were told is, yeah, we know all about it, guys. Uh, there's nothing we can do for you. Uh, and 
Yeah, yeah and I mean, that's where we are. CEDA is supporting projects which are actually helping NGOs to, to, to make it possible to be anonymous and to even, uh, you know, when you're oppressed, to, to find uh, paths uh, through the system. So we are actually promoting uh, action activists on the net uh, knowing that the political will is, I mean, that's, it's not in place. But at the same time, what it's important in, in countries where we work is to support local community groups that can actually support the activists and, and build uh, protection around activists that are really using not only new technologies, but actually being, you know, citizens that want to be heard. So there are ways, but we have to work with NGOs and systems around, and if we really believe in this, we cannot just work with countries that are willing to. We also need to demonstrate what, what's, you know, what, what's needed and what's happening in countries that are not willing to, to be credible. I would agree with that, and I think a big part of the challenge we collectively face is making sure that as we bring potentially very empowering tools and information to citizens, that we protect them in this mm -hmm. process and that we educate them and also make sure that when they do participate um, in monitoring and accountability and reporting, that in doing so, they remain safe and mm -hmm. protected. I definitely agree. So one more, and it also goes sort of to the heart of every, everyone's, in everyone's mind what we're thinking about, and it's quite clear. Uh, can you make connection more clear how tech openness leads to more capable and responsive government? So how are we gonna measure ourselves <laughs> is the basic question. Well, I think it's a very good question, and I'm, I'm, there's a lot of hope in this uh, uh, program now in finding the measurements. But just to give you one example from, from my country, is that, uh, and that's Sweden, and I think probably a bit advanced in this, uh, there's still work to be done on, uh, you know, demonstrating to citizens how uh, point of views are being used. Uh, and, and I think this is really what has to be measured, is, is a clear process to start with. This is, what, this is the information you need to respond, and this is the way we're going to use the response. And, and, and that has to be measured, and I don't know enough examples to, to tell you that it's up and running and it's working and there's good, good practice, but yeah. maybe you have more. Right, and I think we would be all naive to believe that there's a single sort of silver, sort of shining solution, mm. but I think what we all know is that basic building blocks of transparency yeah. are, enable accountability in a way that was never before possible. Mm -hmm. So making budgets available online and via SMS and mobile at a local level by default enables people to see and track how resources are being spent. Being able to report if teachers show up in classrooms by default enables a notion of transparency and accountability um, that we'll be able to track over time. So I think it's, it can only move in a positive direction and I think part of the challenge that we collectively have is helping uh, identify key metrics that we can share across communities. Mm. I, you know, I think it's a great conversation. I, the only point that I would add is just that, you know, one thing that journalists have always known mm. uh, is that accountability and faith in government are not the same thing. The one might be a prerequisite for the other. And while accountability may increase as a result of this mm. increased transparency, that does not necessarily mean that, that faith in government will necessarily follow. And exactly. that's why I think you have a good example here in the United States mm. where um, you, know, you have seen the Obama administration mm. has certainly taken steps as have local and state governments over the last few years to increase transparency when it comes to certain measures. Ultimately, there then needs to be leadership what, about what to do about it. And you know, journalists all know the feeling of you know breaking some important story that really uh, showcases something that's been going on behind the scenes in government uh, in a way that you think, well, that's going to bring results. That's going to change things. And sometimes it does, and sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. Mm -hmm. well, and just to just to sort of uh, walk the talk, um, <laughs> anybody who's online or anybody here who wants to tweet ideas on how. We can do a better job measuring exactly how to make governments more responsive to their citizens. Please send it in and we'll take it into account. And with that, I'd like to thank our, our first panel. Please thank them for joining us. Thank you. Now, when, um, you. Now, when we, uh, when we uh, came into the room, you may have heard what's commonly known for those of us who spent some time on stage, the voice of God. Um, inviting us to sit down. Well, uh, for those of us who are active in the internet and technology arena, the voice of God is about to appear. Please welcome a short video message from Vince Cerf. 
Hello, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's Chief Internet Evangelist, and today I'd like to speak to you about making all voices count. I can't imagine anything more important in a world where the Internet is beginning to spread to all corners of the globe. But more important, it is not yet accessible to everyone. We think that there are about 3 billion people who are online, including many who use mobiles as their sole means of access to the Internet. But that still means that we have billions more uh, to, uh, to bring to, uh, to the table. What is very important, I think, is to make sure that this technology is, in fact, accessible and affordable all around the world. And by good fortune, physics is in our favor. I think the cost of equipment, the cost of communications is dropping, uh, and we can increasingly cover larger and larger economic territories. Uh, with access to the Internet, but there w must be a will in each country to foster, uh, to create frameworks and to foster uh, the investment to create this infrastructure and make it accessible to uh, everyone. Uh, at the Internet Society, we have a, an expression, Internet is for everyone, and of course we want it to be, but we have work to do to make that true. I think another <clears throat> important notion is that this is a two-way communications channel. Uh, governments can be very helpful to their citizens by providing information to them to uh, allow them to act uh, effectively as citizens uh, and to know what things they can do, what things they can expect from the government, what the government expects from them. Uh, by the same token, governments need to make it possible for uh, individuals to communicate back the other way. I, I know when the uh, Internet became popular in political circles, uh, many of uh, the senators and congressmen in the United States saw it as an opportunity to push information out to their constituents, and they were uh, surprised, many of them anyway, that this was a two-way street, and they were getting a great deal of information back uh, from their constituents in many different forms, sometimes emails, sometimes, uh, of course, today, tweets, blogs, and other sorts of means of expression. I think perhaps the most important thing, however, that we must all concentrate on is to assure that those voices that would ordinarily not be heard not only are amplified, but are able to reach the persons uh, who should hear those expressions. The stories that we tell each other in the blogs, uh, the YouTube videos that, uh, that people put up, are uh, in some sense fundamental uh, to our ability to talk to each other and to make each other aware of what's going on in the world. In places where the Internet is suppressed, we need to work around that to, uh, to make it accessible in, despite uh, those limitations. And I think in places where the Internet is widely available, we need to explore in ways of improving the utility of this remarkable infrastructure for everyone. Well, I don't mean to take up any more of your time today. I know you have many important things to discuss, but, and I, I wish very much I could be there with you. But since I cannot, uh, I hope someone is taking good notes so that uh, the rest of us who are not at the meeting will be able to share uh, in the things that you uh, discover and the things that you uh, recognize are uh, actionable for the rest of us. So thanks again for letting me chat for a few minutes. I look forward to seeing you uh, on the net. Few people are as strong advocates for development as our next speaker. She witnessed firsthand the power of citizens' voices to continuously uh, to advocate on behalf of people to ensure that they're heard. And we're thrilled to have such a powerful voice on behalf of citizen engagement and particularly government accountability around the world with us today. Please welcome to the stage former U.S. Secretary of State and current chair of the Albright Stone Group, Madeline K. Albright. Thank you very much, and greetings to everybody, and I'm very pleased to be here to join with you in launching the Grand Challenge for Development. And I want to congratulate the Omidara Network and the development agencies of Sweden and the United Kingdom and the United States for coming together um, in really what is a very, very exciting uh, four-way partnership. It's great to be with you here, Raj, Samantha, and everybody. It's really, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this. Without question, making all voices count is a concept whose time has come. Recent events in Burma and the Middle East and North Africa remind us how powerful the desire for freedom is and 
how quickly the world can change. Technology has opened the door to further democratic gains by enhancing the capacity of people to organize and to do so, as we've seen, with lightning speed and from the bottom up. And our collective task is to support that capability and to encourage people to express themselves uh, in ways that contribute to social progress. At the same time, um, I believe that we have to press governments across the globe to be more open, transparent, and accessible. And dictators and demagogues learned long ago that having a monopoly on information is the best way to seize and maintain power. The Making All Voices Count initiative is based on our understanding that it's more difficult now than it has ever been to control the flow of knowledge, and that is all to the good. Democracy thrives on diversity and becomes stronger through vigorous debate. Its very identity is based on the free expression of popular will. And that's one reason why the new information and social networking technologies have such potential. And it's been very interesting to listen to all the ideas that are out there. Um, because we can see that they can be used in a host of ways to educate, inform, create links among um, disparate groups, and help people everywhere to be heard. They also have the ability, if employed wisely, to level the economic playing field for women and to shine a spotlight on such violations of public trust as corruption, incompetence, and the abuse of human rights. And to its credit, the grand challenge for development focuses on both sides of the communication equation. First, aiding the public in articulating its concerns and then helping governments to respond. And this matters because in a democracy, the people and their representatives should act as partners, um, a principle that even in our own nation we sometimes forget. Uh, in the best case, there will be a balance between what the public demands and what institutions uh, can deliver. And this requires realistic expectations on one side, effective governance on the other, and first-rate communication between the two. As chair of the National Democratic Institute, and I'm very happy to be here with Ken Wallach, who's president, I've been involved in many projects designed to achieve such a balance including one currently underway with friends from the Omidar Network and others. And this initiative seeks to engage techno-savvy civil society groups in helping parliaments harness technology to better respond to citizen demands. This effort has led to the development of a Declaration on Parliamentary Openness, endorsed by over 100 organizations from over 70 countries. The declaration serves as a roadmap for representative institutions seeking to become more open and transparent and encourages partnership between civic groups and parliaments. And I've long believed in the importance of such partnerships. When I was Secretary of State, I helped to launch a movement called the Community of Democracies based on the idea that democratic governments and cooperation with civil society should help and learn from one another. The Making All Voices Count initiative reflects that same approach. Democratic solidarity is vital because the transition from an authoritarian regime to a freely elected one is so very difficult. As we can see today in the Middle East, the euphoria that accompanies a popular revolution can be hard to sustain. Empowered citizens are essential to democracy, but they're not sufficient. Representative institutions must be equipped to govern, and governments are often required to do unpopular things, to take on powerful institutions, raise revenue, set priorities, and embrace compromise. Listen. Um, <laughs> to avoid misunderstanding, tough decisions must be justified and explained, and here again, Modern communications can help to accomplish that. But as we go forward, we must also bear in mind that technology, for all its promise, has no inherent moral value. In the middle of the last century, Hitler's propagandists used radio to bring millions of people under the spell of a single monstrous ideology. 
In that same era, my father was heard of wartime was head of wartime broadcasting for the Czechoslovak government in exile from London. And each night for five years, the airwaves became a battleground between vicious lies and endangered truth. In the 1940s, when the communists seized control in Central Europe, they began by taking over newspapers and radio stations. Decades later, the distribution of Czechoslovakia's Charter 77 and the Polish Solidarity's underground press helped to destroy the Berlin Wall and liberate half a continent. In the 1990s, hate radio did much to ignite genocide in Rwanda, something Samantha's written about, but the internet proved vital in reuniting refugee families who had fled violence in Kosovo and Sierra Leone. More recently, Al-Qaeda and its allies have relied on the new technologies to organize and publicize their crimes. Meanwhile, Arab demonstrators have used online connections to build momentum for democracy. The latest inventions are amazing because they help people to accomplish what they choose. But our future depends on what people choose to do. And that's why it matters so much that we make the most of technology's potential to encourage critical thinking, expand knowledge, defend human rights, and strengthen democracy. It's also why we need to support collaborations such as this to ensure that every voice is heard and that all voices count. And in that regard, I want to reiterate my thanks to the Omidar Network and to our three participating governments and to everybody here. It is said that anything worth doing is done in faith. So let's go forward with the faith that freedom of thought, when combined with the genius to innovate and a healthy dose of conscience, can lead us to a world more just and humane in the future than it has ever been in the past. Thank you all very, very much for all your work. I'd like to invite our next uh, panelists onto the stage, and we'll do our best. We're a little bit behind on time, but we'll do our best to try to include some Twitter questions at the end. Um, this panel is really a discussion with partner technologists, and please welcome Stephen King, the partner from the Omidyar Network, uh, Basun Tiyani, the co-founder of the Co-Creation Hub, and Yemi Adam Alakun, executive director of Enough Enough. Enough <laughs> is Enough from Nigeria. <coughs> Stephen? Great. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Andrew, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I won't <clears throat> echo all the thanks that have already been given to the other partners and to the, the people present, but uh, certainly on behalf of the Midian Network, we're very privileged to be part of this, um, I think, unique collaboration. Um, and so we're going to be talking a little bit today with partners that um, the Midian Network have supported, plus others about some of the real potential for technology to drive open government and to drive participation and also to, um, to overcome some of those challenges that, um, that we've talked about this morning. Um, and for Media Network, this is a really important part of the work we do. Um, Pierre Media, who's the founder of eBay, um, set up a Media Network to tackle some of the world's most intractable problems. And not surprisingly, given our heritage and our background, we believe technology has a really important role to play in driving citizen um, engagement with government and also opening up government as well. Um, and so we're going to be talking this morning, I think, about some of the, 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 the ways in which that's happening, but also some of the challenges as well, because I think it's been said a couple of times this morning that technology is a tool. It's not the silver bullet. And I think we need to um, remember that as we, as we think about the potential and also the, the exciting challenges that lay ahead with the Making All Voices Count initiative. So I wanted to start off perhaps and, and ask Yemi um, from the, per the, the perspective of Enough is Enough, which is a, a citizen movement in Nigeria, um, the ways in which technology has, has helped to drive that movement, particularly around the presidential elections. So share with us your thoughts and some of the, the, the good and the bad sides of this. I think I, I'll situate it within the context of a, um, a government that's threatened by technology. And I think what technology, as you keep saying, as a tool, 
um, social media in Nigeria has gotten hugely popular over the last two years. And it's very simple. It's uncensored and it's free. So you have a lot of young Nigerians who've taken to social media to actually express their angst, their frustrations, and also prefer ideas and solutions. So last year during the presidential elections, um, social, we actually uh, created a social media tracking center, which as far as we know is the first of its kind in the world, that basically tracked how social media was following the elections. So from Facebook posts to tweets to blogs, how are people reporting elections, reporting um, results, reporting happenings, reporting violence. And when there was post-election violence in the north, we found out that social media picked that up faster than traditional media picked it up as well. So I think um, uh, we also developed a tool, a mobile uh, uh, phone application, that allowed you to report results from your polling unit. So that, in terms of en encouraging young Nigerians to use a medium familiar with, to them to get engaged in the process, report what they see, and engage, um, and engage both as citizen reporters and also people who are participating in the electoral process, I think has also changed the dynamics of how people see, see the tool of technology and governance. Yeah. And do you think it's as widespread as, as, as people think? I mean, to some extent, five years ago, we wouldn't have had this conversation. It would have been, this is for the geeks in the developed world. Whereas, I mean, and seeing it from afar, there's always that, there's that um, sort of idea that it's not, it's not used in villages, it's not used um, in, you know, outside of the urban elite. Is, is that the case? I think there is some truth to that. I mean, if we looked at the reports that we got from Revoda, it actually followed Nigeria's broadband map. So we got the most um, reports from places that had the greatest internet penetration. But for the fact that Nigerians, uh, I think most people who access, I forget what the percentage is, but most people who access the internet in Nigeria access it from their mobile phones, also shows what the growth of as Nigeria continues to, and there's a commitment on the part of the government to deepen internet penetration or broadband penetration. As that continues to grow, people will use the internet more. So yes, that is the case. But as you rightly said, five years ago, we have been having this conversation. Now we're having it a bit more in another five years it would be a wider audience or a wider group of people who have access to it. And, and Bosun, I mean, you're <clears throat> one of the founders of the co-creation hub, which is a, um, a technology hub in Lagos. And now I think there's more than 70 of these across Africa. The number you know, grows every week as, as we see these emerge. This is obviously an opportunity for, for those developers and for those technologists to get together. Um, are they particularly focusing on, on social innovations, do you find? Yeah, um, I think we have a strong focus on so social innovation, um, but, but the interesting dimension to what we do, uh, which is slightly different from the elections, is we've always been in a situation where citizens engage in governance only during elections. And the question we started asking was, how can we use technology to then engage people beyond the election in good governance? Um, there's, there's, of course, the perennial corruption and uh, the, the widespread helplessness that people feel that things are not going the way they should go. But we believe that if we're going to drive good governance, it shouldn't just be left to the government. But citizens should also look for ways to take actions to create solutions, uh, be it technology solution or non-technological solutions that can actually help bridge the gap between government and citizens. And I think we've done quite a bit in that space. We've worked with uh, quite a number of uh, interesting individuals. And we can already see that technology is actually amplifying the voices of people. Uh, it's bringing to the fore interesting conversations. But along the line as well, we've also noticed that there are deeper issues that are sort of uh, coming up as barriers to making our voices count. Mm. And, and in our opinion, some of the things we'll see is that the society, you know, there's a culture within our society which traditionally wouldn't expect that you should raise your voice against your leaders. And there are popular culture as well that will tell you that uh, if you're part of the elite, uh, you may end up being the governor uh, in two years' time. So you don't want to talk too much because it may be your turn. Uh, we have an education system uh, that simply teaches you not to question your teachers. And if a lot of people are raised through this sort of system, how do you expect them to be able to ask questions? And most importantly, we're very religious as well. And for those who practice uh, probably Islam or even Christianity, with the, the way we practice it in, in our society, a lot of these religions will tell you not to question your leaders, but to actually pray for them and ask for God to lead them right. So, so these are some of the challenges we've seen, and we're being sort of propelled and encouraged to actually look for more civic actors from within the society who understand some of these deep issues and can come up with solutions uh, to some of the problems. Part of the challenge with that is uh, there's going to be a lot of experimentation 
in the midst. Because what you get is a lot of the things people do are only driven by a strong sense of, uh, of, 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 of belief that the change is possible and not fact. So you will find people doing things that will be successful. A lot of things will not be successful. And I think we can give a lot of that to a media network. Uh, your attitude towards supporting experimentation. And I think the same for Indigo Trust as well in London. You know, the belief that you can actually in invest in people to try something out. And probably at the end of the day, some of the things they try may actually become successful. And I think we're seeing that in budget, tr budget transparency in some of the things happening in the hub. Uh, we have a set of people that are looking to also track uh, project public works implementation to see if they're actually being implemented. You know, we have a new platform that is also looking at pulling people's opinion on certain social, economic, and political issues, and then throwing back the, the facts to them and engaging them in discussions around mm. these facts. One of the things that um, I think we've noticed at the Midian Network um, <clears throat> through many of the um, grants and investments we've done is that there's a lot of activity at a city level and at a state level, and often that's where people feel that they have the, the problems of, of government or lack of service delivery are more real for them. It's about their area, it's about their school, it's their hospital. And both of you are living in Lagos, um, and obviously that's a, one of the, the world's great cities, um, but also a city with a large amount of problems. What do you think is the opportunity to, to use these kind of funds that Making All Voices Count will provide to, to sponsor that kind of innovation and risk-taking that you're talking about, both at a city level? How do you think that would work? I think that, that part of government is actually the most delicate part uh, in Nigeria, of course, and I think in most African countries. Because the guys at the top, um, they use the, the lower level to achieve most of their objectives. And things are not done properly. It's actually the most difficult place to seek transparency. And part of what we're trying to do at that level is, beyond transparency, how can we tap into the expertise of the ordinary Nigerians to help those guys at that level to deliver value? for the society. Because the general perception is they're there not necessarily to deliver anything. So, so I, it comes back to the issue of good governance in our opinion should be more towards social accountability where people begin to see their role in building a better society uh, as against pushing because we're at the stage where when we push too hard, uh, most of the governments in Africa will push back and they'll find ways to suppress opinions. But how can we work with them? There's this general belief that a government, again, they're, they're pretty aware of what they should be doing. But the truth is it's not always the, the, the case in, in most uh, of our society. It, a lot of people in power lack the understanding of what they should be doing. But how can we get good people from within the society to work with these guys to, to get things done. And one of the things we've mentioned <clears throat> again this morning in a number of different panels was the opportunity that Making All Voices Count has to actually spark those innovative collaborations right. between reformers and champions in government and those within civil society. Uh, what do you think about the, that, Yemi? Do you, do you think that was, is something that's worth pursuing? Oh, definitely. I think it's probably the only way for sustained change because as we were talking about earlier, if you look at, I mean, talking technology as a tool, both for citizens to report but also for government to manage the results that they get. And one of the things that's been very interesting in Nigerian Twitter space over the last one year is that you got a rash of government officials who came on Twitter who wanted to engage. But I think what they forgot was that unlike traditional media, Twitter is a two-way street. So you push information, people push back. And if you say something stupid, they'll tell you you're stupid. So I think that for a lot of them was a big shock. So I mean, one of the ministers actually planned to do a monthly tweet meet but couldn't continue because he just could not handle not only the level of suggestions he was getting based on what he wanted to do, but also really the level of people attacking and actually asking really pointed questions. So I think definitely you've, when you find partners in government who want to help, who want to take in the results, because at the end of the day, if you do fix my street, for example, and you report that there's a pothole somewhere, if there's nobody on the other end who's willing yeah. to take that information, like the Russian example that was given earlier, and do something about it, then it just becomes a dead data point. But I think that, that is extremely important in not only uh, pushing government to deliver services better, but willing to work with them to actually make, sh make sure that what you're asking for actually gets done. So it's extremely important. And I think just to piggyback a bit on what Boston said earlier, if you take some of the, one of the um, social enterprises at the hub budget, one of the work, the budget is a, um, a startup, probably started up this year, that uses infographics to make the Nigerian budget easier for people to understand. 
So for example, earlier in the year, one of the big things was that when we found out that um, a billion naira, I forget what it is in dollars, would be of a president's food budget, that became a butt of jokes. So people were saying that they're eating Gucci rice or Versace uh, beans or whatever it was. But they allowed people to think about the budget in ways that I never really thought about before. But now you have a tool that makes it easy for you to understand the numbers, then how do you now use that information to demand better accountability or better use of the funds that we have? So we have time for uh, a couple of quick questions from Twitter. Um, one is really interesting because we've been talking a little bit about how citizens connect to governments and governments might be able to respond back. But this question is, how do we ensure that open marginalized voices on the ground help shape the global development agenda? So how do we get those voices to actually do more than just to the governments, but holistically mm -hmm. a broader agenda? It's a very good question. Well, one of the, perhaps to add something in here, because um, I think the British ambassador mentioned earlier on, and Justin Greening also mentioned that um, the, the UK is, is helping to co-chair the high-level panel on Millennium Development Goals. And one of the um, interesting um, uh, developments here is that there is now an attempt to crowdsource and seek people's input into the what should be the next stage of the Millennium Development Goals. And again, reflecting that 15 years ago when you know, the, these original goals were being thought of, there wasn't that attempt and there wasn't the technology that allowed us to even seek people's views and seek people's opinions. Now, I think the fact that there is now the, those technology channels really gives us, I think, a responsibility to be going out and to asking people, what are your priorities? What should shape these Millennium Development Goals or other government priorities in the future? And the, ne the next question, actually, you, know, you, you listed a couple of, of um, tools. I'm just curious if Bosun might what, what answer this question. What are your favorite tools for citizens to use to hold governments accountable? Yeah, that, that's a tough one for me. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well sold around the whole fact that driving good governance is our collective responsibility uh, in, in Africa, uh, because I think the government uh, is part of the society, and we've had years of, of not necessarily leveraging our resources the best way to develop our society. So, so the best tool for me will be tools uh, that are strong at encouraging citizens to also learn more about uh, the whole issues around governance as a whole and how talented in individuals can begin to also contribute to making things better. So, so budget will be a good example. Um, budget is not necessarily trying to breed thousands of people that will most likely take to the street, but trying to build a knowledge revolution in the sense that where you understand from a budget perspective what's available to your government, you first will probably know what you can be pushing for. And in certain cases, you actually find, find out that the government doesn't have the budget to do what you're demanding for. So as against just pushing, you're pushing from, from an intellectual point of view. And I think it's all that educating our people and getting us to understand that we need to drive things from a knowledge perspective that is the solution. Okay, and the last one's actually pretty interesting too, which is how can startup companies and organizations share, communicate their technologies and capabilities with actors who can leverage them? So how do, how do the emerging technologies plug into this initiative and make themselves available to a much wider audience and a much wider um, goal? Hobbes, talk about it from the Hobbes perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's learning from, from the technology innovation as it is. Um, if we're talking about using technology to drive transparency, we need to understand uh, what are the unique features of successful uh, technology businesses, uh, which for me would always come back to experimentation. Uh, there's, there's tons of investment uh, within technology organizations in trying to come up with knowledge and, and solutions that are superior, and that's what set them aside. And you know, if we take the example of Google, for instance, uh, Google is a good uh, uh, organization that came out of deep research work. You know, uh, some people thought there was a need to disrupt the way search was being done. Uh, they came up with good algorithm. Uh, they had the opportunity to be within a university that gave them the support to do that. And I think that's what we need to, to, to encourage in Africa as well. If we're going to use technology to make things happen, we need to allow people to try, fail. And in the midst of failing, you actually see some people that will fail forward. And uh, that's the solution for me for most of the startups we work. 
Yeah. Any final words, Stephen? Yeah, I, mean, I think <clears throat> to echo what uh, Boson said, and I think Co-Creation Hub and some of the technology hubs are part of the answer to this, is that they provide a space for, um, for, for technologists, for civil society organizations, for innovators and risk takers. Um, they can congregate there. There's that serendipitous meeting that happens. There's the, the mentoring and there's the seed corn funding that, that, that you and others um, provide that can, that can marry those two worlds of the kind of technology and also those who are trying to do social good. And I think that's the real opportunity and real promise of these kind of initiatives. So please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for joining us this morning. I'd like to, uh, for USAID, I'd like to acknowledge that you heard about some of the partners in this project, um, but there are many, many others that actually didn't get, we didn't get a chance to mention. We should really thank everybody who was involved in this effort, and you should keep an eye on this space because it's going to continue to grow, bring more partners, and we encourage you to join us. And thank you all of those who put this event on today, and thank you for coming. See you outside. We have some examples for you to continue to, to see, and also... Um, so, you know, an opportunity for you to meet each other uh, out, right outside these doors. Thank you again.